everybody, it is Dean Z speaking to you once again from my basement. And I'm here in my basement because today we're gonna do a full application review. And I really like to be in a cozy chair when I'm doing that. It is critical to my process. So let's get started without further ado. Today, I got two piles of paper to work with. And that is because thanks to the very good suggestion of a viewer, I'm gonna be working on an application where the candidate applied one year, didn't get in, reapplied, did get in. So we're gonna analyze what's, difference, what's the difference between the two applications uh, and which, which of those differences made a difference in the outcome and which were just distinctions that didn't carry any weight. So let us get started. I'm going to call this application, or rather this applicant, I'm going to call this applicant Jack. All right. Um, let's start. Past viewers will know I really like to start with the resume. So let's get started and go to the resume. I can tell you uh, a couple of uh, introductory tidbits about this applicant. One, he is from the American Southwest. Uh, he started out at community college uh, before finishing up at his state's flagship institution. And he, yeah, and which I, I'll just say, I, I like to see that. Uh, we, we don't see a ton of applicants who start out at community college. Uh, it, it's, it's a longer road. It is, it is um, less traveled path to get to law school. And so that's a, a kind of uh, background, a diverse background that I find very helpful to have in the cohort of the entering class. One small difference I noticed right away between the first application and the second application is that he includes his Instagram handle in the uh, first application and he takes it off in the second application. That doesn't make a difference, but uh, I will note, uh, you don't, I've said in past episodes, you know, admissions officers don't go around checking social media for the most part, but why invite them? Why make them uh, think that that's a, a, an important part of uh, your background and something you want them to look at. There's no need to put that on there. So I thought, I think it was smart for him to take it off uh, on his second application. He has some differences uh, that are both information he's left off in the second that he had in the first and information he's included in the second that he didn't have in the first. And they are both, both of the things he's chosen to admit and the things he's chosen to add really improve the resume in small ways, but often it is small differences that will end up making a difference. So uh, it's just uh, better formatted the second time. It's sort of neater, takes out information that is unnecessary. Like for example, he has a, he describes a study abroad program he engaged in. And in the, in the first uh, application, he includes the names of the, the supervisor on the study abroad program, totally unnecessary. So, Get rid of the stuff that is unnecessary. It, it clutters it up. It uh, makes it more difficult to read and, you know, just sort of slows things down. So good change there. Um, and then his job is the same. Both years had the same job, but he, he starts out in the first application. He starts out with, uh, I don't want to sound harsh, but completely irrelevant information about how he taught himself some software and used that software in the job all while not really explaining what the, the job is. I can tell it is a nonprofit, it is a food bank, and he's doing community engagement, so I know a little bit about it. But his second application just starts with a bullet that sums up his mission, his job responsibilities, the, you know, sort of the crux of what he's doing. And it's just so much of a stronger uh, way to begin than talking about the software. He also, in the second application, includes various metrics of achievements, things that he has done working with X number of people, uh, recruiting partners, that sort of thing. And uh, so it's, it's making it clear exactly what he has achieved in this job. That's very helpful. I like that. Uh, one change he didn't make in his uh, resume that he could have made that would have been helpful uh, is he has several positions that are old positions, things he's not currently doing listed here. And he's talking about them in both applications in the present tense. One good rule of thumb when you're writing an application, uh, writing a resume, if if you're done with the job, done with the position, put it, make sure everything is in past tense because it's not happening anymore. 
that is a minor detail, but you know, might as well do it when you're cleaning things up. Other than uh, the current job changes that I, I mentioned, the other jobs he lists are pretty similar. There's not a lot of differences there. Uh, but I will note one thing he also left off that would have been helpful is um, he, he includes perhaps more detail than he needs to about these past positions. And he doesn't give me any information about uh, work or volunteer activities or anything else he was doing while in undergrad. So neither in the community college nor in the um, bachelor's program that he was in. Uh, he just doesn't talk about what he, he was doing while he was studying. I, spoiler alert, I can tell from essays and from his letters of rec that he was doing other things. So it would have been helpful to him if he had included that. I think he was probably intent on keeping his resume to two pages, uh, which, you know, I think is helpful. Uh, the, you know, if you need more space, you can take more space, but you have to, you know, you, you're going to be held to a standard of like, does this need to be here? So if it's going over two pages, there's, you know, you're, you're going to, be facing a little skepticism from the reader of like, did I really need to see all this detail? So use that space wisely. Um, jettison the old stuff, the details that maybe aren't as compelling, and but make sure that you have listed the titles of uh, the positions that you held so I can really know what you were doing with your time. Okay, he does include a section on here uh, about leadership and other experience other than his paid jobs. And that's very helpful. It shows me that he was uh, on, he is at the time of applying uh, on a, the board of directors of a uh, community healthcare organization. That is extremely impressive for a young person. Uh, it also shows his new application shows um, some mentoring that he has done that doesn't show up in the uh, older application. So that is presumably, a, a, can't tell if it's a new activity. He doesn't give me dates, so which I would have liked, but uh, I can't tell if it's a new activity or if it's just something that he didn't think to add the first time, but I think that is clever to add. This time, um, he leaves off a, a networking group that he was part of that he included in the first application that doesn't really move the ball forward. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, along the lines of, you know, a, a professional organization. Um, that is good for you to do, but doesn't really tell me a lot about, about you and your achievements. It's, uh, so if you're going to leave something on the, on the cutting room floor, as it were, that would be a good thing to jettison. In his new application, he adds an interest section, which I love. And so now I know that he's a musician who can play guitar, drums, and, um, piano, and that he's interested in 20th century, uh, American literature. These are all things that really fill him out as a human that he didn't include the first time. So this is these are small changes that are already making me feel like I, I know him better and um, feeling a little more engaged with the application. He does uh, include in both resumes, he includes a list of his references. Absolutely not necessary. Good to get rid of that. Uh, if you have a recommender, I will see it elsewhere in the application. No need to list names here. Um, okay. Great. I think that's it for the resume. Let's move on. Let's go now to sort of the, the very first part of the application. I'm going to point out a difference between the applications that actually doesn't make a difference, but I feel compelled to observe it. The first time he applied, he applied in October. The second time he applied, he applied on the first day our application was open. And I, I know that people get very anxious about trying to apply as early in the process as possible. So maybe I shouldn't even point this out because maybe you will not hear me when I am saying it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter, okay? So the difference between August and October is no difference at all in terms of outcomes. So um, I think I think it makes sense if you're reapplying that you'd apply earlier uh, because presumably you're all ready to go. You've gone through this once already, uh, but you don't need to hustle to get it in on the very first day. I would say good rule of thumb is do your best to get an application in before the end of the calendar year, so before uh, New Year's. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, 
the timing at that point the timing may make a difference because things really slow down for us um towards the end of the reviewing but and and it means you'll get your application decision much later if you apply after that but other than that don't worry about timing maybe i shouldn't even mention that but here we are Anyway, all right, so now I'm looking at the part of the application that's, for the most part, a little boring. Doesn't tell me too much about the candidate. It's like name, address, blah, blah, blah. I've already told you he's from the Southwest. Um, I can tell you, though, that in the second application, we have a question that says, if you've ever applied before, let us know. In the second application, he has let us know that information and told us the term for which he applied. Um, what happens when you do that? We have um, I have first readers uh, who write out comment sheets for every application they read. And when I read a file, I look at those comment sheets. We, If you get admitted and enroll at Michigan, we get rid of your comment sheet. We shred it before you get here because I don't need it anymore. If, however, you don't get in or you don't, or you get in and you don't enroll, we do, we save your application comment sheet uh, for in case you reapply. So then I will get that old comment sheet and I'll be able to compare the new one with the old one and easily see distinctions without having to actually look up your old application um, and open a whole new electronic file in the database that we use which saves me a lot of time and, and sort of just gives me the bullet points I need to see. Um, so it's very rare that we would actually go back to the original application and, and look at in that much detail. It would have to be some something really confusing between some really confusing difference between the first and second application that I was seeing on the comment sheet uh, to make me go do that. So just so you know what's happening behind the scenes. Because this candidate is someone who we admitted and is enrolled uh, at Michigan, I have neither comment sheet, so I can't use those to illustrate uh, the differences, uh, you know, between between them, which I would have seen when I was doing the actual reviewing the first time around. But I wanted you to, to have that background context. All right, uh, next. I will note that in his first application, we ask about family information. Um, and he tells me about his mother and uh, that she is, is not um, her, you know, she had a very low level of education. She didn't graduate from high school and she works a, um, a blue collar kind of job. Uh, and he doesn't tell me anything about his father. The second application, he does tell me about his father. Now, I don't, I don't know specifically what led to the change, but I will tell you, I like information. So I'm, if I'm asking a question and you don't answer the question, like if I'm asking about two parents and you only give me information about one parent, I don't know whether that's because you only know about one parent, um, you're estranged from a parent, or whether you just didn't feel like filling that out because it's not required. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just be guessing. And again, it's not going to have a huge weight, but it might have a little weight. Right. And so when I look at it and I see that this information is missing in the first time he applied, I might be drawing a conclusion like this is someone who maybe didn't put a ton of effort into the application. And if there are other things like that in the application, if that is uh, if the same thing occurs in other places, it will lead me to draw a slightly negative conclusion. So I like that the second time he dotted all his I's and crossed all his T's and gave me all this information. So I can tell you he's first gen, which is um, an element of diversity uh, that, you know, I find very valuable, gives it a really helpful voice in the classroom. And it also gives me some context to evaluate the achievements that he has. You know, he is not someone whose parents were helping him with the college application process. Uh, he was navigating all this on his own. So that is, that's just helpful background information for me to assess what he's achieved. Okay, nothing else too interesting here. Uh, so, and we already talked about the resume. So let's move past that and get to the essays. This is, this is where the magic happens. So now we have two uh, different sets of essays. 
And this is, I would say, something that made a huge difference uh, in, in his success. Uh, the first time he writes, uh, his his essay is, is really um, sort of a, a walking through of his resume. He begins by saying, by now you are well aware of my what, the board of directors I sit on, the schools I attended, and the professional experience I've accumulated. I wanna show you more about the why. And so he takes each of those different um, experiences and talks about what led him to each of them. It's not effective. Like, it's not terrible, um, but I already know what's on his resume. And he's giving me maybe one paragraph about each of those activities as opposed to an essay that really hangs together and tells me something brand new about him that I don't already know. Um, so... It's not, it's not terrible, as I say, but it is, he hasn't done the most with the material that he could have. And then at the end of this first personal statement, he um, does something that I think haunts the nightmares of many applicants, which is to say, he goes on and on about Columbia Law School. He tells me, <laughs> The Columbia is an Ivy League school, and then he praises many of uh, their alumni and uh, their faculty. And uh, this is a problem because we're not Columbia Law School. So again, that's not fatal, but that is making me think. Okay, this is this person has not put the effort into the application that I want to see. And then he includes one optional essay, which he titles Michigan Law, which suggests that it's going to be an essay about Michigan law. Uh, but it isn't. I, I don't, it's, it's really honestly unclear what, what essay prompt he is answering here. Um, he talks about sort of his goals. I think it's probably, uh, the essay prompt that we have that asks us to talk about, ask you to talk about your, um, future uh, career, but he's really talking again about everything on his resume and sort of winds up by saying, you know, maybe the ACLU would be where he'd like to work. It's just, again, it's, it's nothing new here. It is not making the most of this space and it's a disappointment. So, uh, that's an important problem for him. In contrast, the second essay is so so much better. It tells me things that I do not know uh, from anywhere else in his application. It tells me about uh, family trauma that he's had. I won't go into um, um, details, um, but he it's, a, it's about two and a half pages and um, it gives very compelling details. It, it tells a story. It makes me feel like I've really gotten to know him. It isn't uh, just a litany of woe, though it is, uh, it's a very positive tone. It's saying this, this happened to me and this is what led me to where I am. And it's just so much more effective than his first personal statement. And then he also includes, um, a diversity statement talking about his own background, um, as, uh, you know, first generation and also the son of, uh, immigrants and, uh, it's very nuanced. It talks about uh, colorism. It talks about uh, um, race. It is. It, and it talks about how it's very intersectional. It talks about how this all works with his first generation identity, uh, and it is really well done. And then he finally does include another uh, uh, essay that is this time is a true why Michigan essay and it um uh, and it's all new information and um i actually love this essay a lot because um he talks about uh alumni of ours uh, one of whom is someone he he knows a bit he, um an elected official in his community uh and i that that shows some research that's not just you know picking something easy out of the air. This is obviously something he has um, done some work to find out. I love that. Uh, and then he also talks about Ann Arbor and he actually teaches me something about Ann Arbor. Remember, I've lived here more than 30 years. So 
I think that always takes some work. He, he, he says that Ann Arbor, uh, elected the country's first openly homosexual individual to hold a public office. And honestly, I read that and I was like, really? I didn't know that. So I actually went and did a little research and it is true. It's someone named Kathy Kozadenko. Yeah, Kathy Kozadenko, who ran for city council in 1974 as a lesbian, and she was out at the time. There were apparently two other people on city council who were gay, but they didn't come out until after they had gotten elected. So she was the first person in the country, apparently, to ever run um, while being out, uh, which is... I, I love it. This person's done a lot of work and um, taught me something. So that is that is rare, and it... Lots of credit for that. Now let's look at um, the metrics and the um, other things that might make a difference in an application. So his LSAT score uh, on his first application was a 157 and his GPA was a 3.66. So both of those numbers are under our medians. So that doesn't count you out by any means, but it does mean you've got a bit of a heavier lift. So I'm looking at all the stuff we already talked about in the context of those two numbers. The second time he applied, he has taken the LSAT again. It's still under our median, but now it's a 164, which definitely improves. That's a, that's a huge jump. That is a uh, almost 20 percentile jump. He's now in the, uh, with the 164, he was in the 89th percentile, which is, um, very, very good. And, you know, does is certainly a strengthening of his application to the extent that there was any uncertainty about his ability to do the work with a 157 and a, a 366. The 164 um, definitely alleviates any concern about that. Uh, we could, as I mentioned, he went to a uh, community college first, all A's on the resume from the community college. And then he transferred to the flagship institution. And I can see that in his very first semester, he had three C's uh, and an A and an A. Yeah, no, two A's and three C's. Sorry. And so, you know, he was struggling a little bit making that transition, uh, which is completely understandable. And it brought down his, his um, GPA. But then after that, he goes on to get all A's and B's and B pluses and a pluses and so forth. So he, he, you know, gets his feet under him, um, after this transfer and shoots out the lights. So that puts, um, his GPA in, in context and makes me think I don't have any concerns about that. He's a, a business major, um, and has taken a wide array of classes, but I don't think it's necessary to go into too much detail about the transcript. The last element of the application that we haven't talked about yet is letters of rec. Now, one thing he didn't do um, between these two applications was to change his letters of rec. I wish he had. I think that is something smart to do if you are reapplying. If only to, even if you have the same letter writers with close to the same content, it, if you can get them to update it, you know, provide a little more information about what you've done since your last application. I think that is helpful. That that shows a couple of things. One, that you are you are you're paying attention to details and you're putting a lot of effort into this. And it tells me that you still have a relationship with these recommenders, which speaks well of you. It's not, you know, this is a real uh, relationship with you ha that you have with your faculty members. Um, he uses two faculty members: one from the community college, one from the. Uh, uh, bachelor's program and they both speak they're both very strong they're not super long uh letters but they they give me no concerns whatsoever they you know they talk about him as um an excellent memorable individual demonstrates academic excellence uh warm and friendly extremely positive a strong desire to excel um exceptional abilities blah 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 outstanding personal character. They clearly, uh, there's a real feeling of warmth that comes from these letters of rec and, uh, which makes me think they would have been perfectly willing to update them. And I, and I think he should have, could have improved his, um, application by asking for that. But I also understand why people don't like to do that because maybe you don't want to go back and tell them that the first round wasn't successful. 
Um, maybe you don't want to go back and ask for more help. Um, so I get it. But if you can get yourself to do it and you're reapplying, that's a smart move. The final thing that made a big difference in this application between the first and the second uh, round is that in the second time, he chose to apply early decision. Uh, now, that isn't a huge weight. I We never admit people um, who are applying early decision who we don't want to admit, right? It's not like, oh, well, they're applying early decision, so no more standards. But if we want to admit them, the, the fact of the matter is when I'm doing this, there, there are many more people who apply who I want to admit than I'm able to have room for. So if you're applying early decision and you're someone I already like, but you're, you know, maybe uh, there's something that a little weakness in your application, for example, you know, you're, you're under both of our medians uh, with your numbers, or perhaps um, you don't have an extensive amount of work experience or, um, whatever it is, you're strong in many ways, but maybe not the perfect application, applying early decision can make a, a difference in outcome. So that would be the final uh, cherry on top, I would say, for his application. So I can tell you, let's sum up, actually. This was Dustin's suggestion. He said, I don't ever bring it all together. So what are the differences here? Um, what got him in? What didn't get him in? Uh, he applied earlier. That didn't really make a difference. He applied early decision. That probably did make a difference. He improved his LSAT score. That made a difference. Uh, he fixed up his resume to make it tighter, better formatted, including more information that is relevant, less information that isn't relevant. He could have done even more with that resume, but what he did was helpful. And then most importantly, I would say, was he really improved his essays. He, he made the most of that uh, opportunity to write uh, write and, and, and told me interesting uh, and important information about himself that isn't included anywhere else in his application and gave me a real sense of who he was. So this candidate actually enrolled at Michigan, is a current student, is doing exceptionally well, is has a great job, uh, and is really a completely delightful human being who I'm very glad to have be part of our community. Uh, so I think that it, that's it. That wraps up our application review for Jack. And I look forward to doing more of these as the season progresses. Leave your comments below, anything you want to tell us, or send an email to us at law.jd.admissions at umich.edu and put vlog in the subject line. Let us know any questions you want us to address or any concerns you have. And uh, thanks, as always, to Dustin for wading through all this and making it all come together. Finally, wherever you go, go blue.